Hey there again, it's Dr. Peevler for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. I have been thinking about how I'm going to start addressing our audience. I'm going to start addressing you as fellow mitochondriacs. I uh, stole this from Dr. Cruz, who calls his members black swan mitochondriacs, but essentially we're all folks who are interested in mitochondria as being the root cause of many, if not most, or all chronic illnesses and how to optimize their functioning. Today, we're going to talk about cancer's other substrate, glutamine. Glutamine is a non-essential amino acid, which means that our body can actually make glutamine, but it has many essential functions, which makes its targeting during mitochondrial metabolic therapy a little more nuanced. Unlike glucose, which we can live off of ketones, we cannot live indefinitely without glutamine. So there is a, in one of the papers that we're going to talk about, a tug of war between cancer cells and normal cells, especially immune cells. So let's dive in. So as, we, as we've talked about and alluded to in several videos in the past when dealing with the Warburg effect, this graphic really is beautiful at illustrating what happens during the metabolic reprogramming that happens during cancer. So under normal circumstances, we have glucose, you have it being trans, transformed into acetyl-CoA, it going through mitochondrial respiratory the TCA cycle and electron transport chain, and you have some degree of glutamine being used for that process to support that process. However, during the metabolic reprogramming that happens during cancer, obviously glucose and the Warburg effect is bringing in glucose about 30 times more than a normal cell. We're producing a ton of lactate, and that glucose is no longer getting into the TCA cycle to be used in oxidative phosphorylation. However, glutamine is also increased significantly, about 10 times more than a normal cell, and it is being being used to create several metabolic precursors to cell growth and division. So as it talks about in this paper, as knowledge of cell metabolism has advanced, glutamine has been considered an important amino acid that supplies carbon and nitrogen to fuel biosynthesis. A recent study provided a new perspective on mitochondrial glutamine metabolism, offering mechanistic insights into glutamine adaptation during tumor hypoxia, the emergence of drug resistance, and glutaminolysis induced metabolic reprogramming and presenting metabolic strategies to target glutamine metabolism in cancer cells. In this review, we introduce the various biosynthetic and bioenergetic roles of glutamine based on the compartmentalization of glutamine metabolism to explain why cells exhibit metabolic reliance on glutamine. Additionally, we examine whether glutamine derivatives contribute to epigenetic regulation associated with tumor genesis. So what we're seeing is that the metabolic reprogramming of the cell during the transition from normal metabolism to the Warburg effect will upregulate the use of glutamine to provide backbones of important chemicals that cancer cells need for rapid growth. However, this is another vicious cycle that we're seeing is that increased use of glutamine and glutamine uptake is also driving this altered metabolism of cancer cells as well. Increased glutaminolysis is now recognized as a key feature of the metabolic profile of cancer cells, along with increased aerobic glycolysis, the Warburg effect. In this review, we discuss the roles of glutamine in contributing to the core metabolism of proliferating cells by supporting energy production and biosynthesis. So this is one of the important roles that Dr. Seafree talks about in his lectures and his books and papers, is that Otto Warburg, the Nobel laureate that is responsible for discovery of what is known as now the Warburg effect, he only knew about at the time in the 30s and 40s about the use of glucose as fuel. However, it has been later elicited and reproduced many times that glutamine is the other secondary important fuel source for cancer cells. Glutaminolysis, a hallmark of cancer metabolism. Glutamine is the most abundant circulating amino acid in blood and muscle and is critical for many fundamental cell functions in cancer cells, including synthesis of biometabolites that maintain mitochondrial metabolism, generation of antioxidants to remove reactive oxygen species, synthesis of non-essential amino acids, purines, pyrimidines, those are important for DNA and RNA synthesis, and fatty acids for cellular rep replication and activation of cell signaling. So what we're also seeing is that glutamine via the release of ammonia is another way that HIF-1 is stabilized and creates another non-oxygen related pseudo hypoxia. So this is causes and consequences of a glutamine induced normoxic HIF-1 activity for tumor metabolism. Under normoxic conditions, normal oxygen conditions, HIF-1 activity was significantly increased by glutamine metabolism, which was associated with the release of ammonia. So this is a fairly busy slide here, but what we're seeing here is 
that glutamine is releasing ammonia. Ammonia is then activating pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, which blocks pyruvate dehydrogenase and blocks pyruvate getting into the TCA cycle. In addition, because of the lack of acetyl-CoA leads to a normoxic HIF-1-alpha stabilization. And as we know and talked about in several videos, when we stabilize HIF, we're able to upregulate several processes that lead to cancer and the Warburg effect. Glucose uptake and lactate dehydrogenase increase, which then leads to the dreaded acidic tumor microenvironment, which then creates another snowball, which further activates HIF and round and round it goes. So I hope that you're seeing through these videos that unfortunately cancer is complex, even when looked at from what I believe to be the more simplistic view as a metabolic or mitochondrial metabolic disease. There are a combination of vicious cycles, glutamine that drives tumor metabolism, glutamine that stabilizes HIF through pseudohypoxia, several other factors that can contribute to the stabilization of HIF and pseudohypoxia. As we've seen in prior photos, part of the tumor microenvironment and part of the tumor structure, there are more normoxic and more hypoxic areas of the tumor architecture. And so we have a lot of barriers to overcome, but kind of zooming out a little bit, if we can, number one, get into a state of ketosis where you have low amounts of glucose circulating and you know how to stabilize HIF through several different mechanisms that which we'll talk about in the future. And we've already talked about whether it be thymine repletion, whether it be vitamin C, whether it be providing sufficient oxygen, et cetera. And if we have targeted strategies, as Dr. Seafree talks about in his press pulse protocols to safely and non-toxically inhibit glutamine transport into cells and glutamine utilization in the Krebs cycle, we have what seems to be a winning strategy at the metabolic management of cancer. As I alluded to in the very beginning part of this video, there is a tug of war that happens between cancer and normal cells. Both need it. And so it's not the same, as I spoke to earlier, it's not the same as ketosis, ketogenic diets, blocking portions of the glycolysis pathway, which is used in mitochondrial metabolic therapies. That is of less consequence because we have ketones that can function as alternative fuels. However, we cannot drastically affect glutamine for a long period of time without causing secondary toxicities and detrimental effects to the body. So as we get through these videos, we're going to be talking about these strategies that are being proposed and being used in alternative cancer clinics around the world as a way to starve cancer of glutamine with as little toxicity to the rest of the body as possible. If you like videos like this, please like, comment, subscribe, and share with friends and family. Until next time.